I just want to. Um, I've just uh, briefly here to welcome all of you to Berkeley Law for this uh, wonderful conference uh, on behalf of the Public Law and Policy Program and our partners with Chase Boudin's Criminal Justice Program and the Heritage Foundation. Uh, welcome to this uh, conference. The uh, purpose of it was when uh, Chase announced he was coming here, uh, I immediately asked him, let's put on a conference on criminal justice and let's bring out the best people on both sides and let's have a honest, open, candid and respectful debate about these issues which trouble all of us so that we can make our communities safer. And so I, this is not my field. I uh, thankfully don't do criminal law, it's too hard for me. <laughs> um, so I'm really looking forward to learning a lot today and figuring out what it is we should do in the future, I hope. Um, I just want to thank a few of the people. I'd like to thank the, uh, Dean Erwin Chemerinsky, who uh, made this possible, and I think Chase especially, for helping organize. This is really a great example of everything he's bringing to the law school, uh, and we're lucky to have him. I also want to thank uh, Drew Kloss and Caroline Chang, who are right over there, who really, really made the whole thing possible. And we're... <laughs> But of course, if the internet breaks down, it's their fault entirely. <laughs> and uh, where's Kate from the Heritage Foundation? Katie? Katie. There she is. And thank Katie from the Heritage Foundation for also a great help. Uh, th thank you very much. And uh, after, I just want to turn it over to uh, Chesa and Zach. Thank you, John, and thanks to everybody who's joined us from far and wide. Um, my name is Chase Boudin. I'm the founding executive director of the Criminal Law and Justice Center here at Berkeley Law School. I've been here a little less than a year, and I'm absolutely thrilled to be able to bring together folks who have inspired me, who I've learned from, um, and to see them engage with people who um, maybe I don't agree with as much on all issues. Um, the reality is that this kind of event is unfortunately rare. Um, too often we're talking to each other, we're preaching to the choir, we're seeking out information and ideas that reconfirm existing narratives in our own mind. And as much as that might be comforting and reassuring to us, it also, I think, increasingly leads to polarization, a hollowing out of the middle, and an erosion of core democratic principles. I really do believe that as much as Zach and I, for example, might disagree on some core issues. I haven't read his new book yet. I think you all have free copies, and notwithstanding the subtitle, I never did receive a single dollar from George Soros. Uh, if you have an inside track on how I could get some money from him, please, Zach, uh, I'd love some advice on that, because I do have to fundraise for this job, and I heard uh, he's a generous donor to some. Um, but the reality is um, we, we have a lot to learn from each other. And we have to listen and we have to be open-minded. Um, I don't expect to agree with everything that people say today. Um, I do expect that I and everybody else in this room will come with an open mind, an open heart, and that we'll start off with some very basic shared principles. One is about a commitment to democracy and mutual respect. Another is that I think we all really deeply and genuinely want to live in safe communities. I think we all want to live in a world where we can have faith in our judicial system. We're in a law school, after all. How we define those things, how we understand safety, safety for who, may be very, very different. But if we start with the common ground and we slowly build out from there, then I think even though it may be that none of us walk away persuaded at the end of the day, I think and I really believe that our democracy will benefit from the kinds of conversations that we're gonna have today. At least that's my hope. So thank you for joining us. Thank you all for being willing to travel, to take time, to engage with people who have very different views, and to be willing to share some of your expertise with all of us today. Zach?
Well, good morning. As Chase mentioned, my name is Zach Smith. I'm a legal fellow at the Heritage Foundation, and I appreciate John and Chase and everyone else here at Berkeley being willing to come out today and engage in these important conversations. And I think the overall question we'll be talking about today is what is the role of the criminal justice system? It's the topic of today's conference, and I think as the title makes clear, uh, there may be differing views about what the role of the criminal justice system is. After all, the topic of today's symposium is justice unveiled, debating crime and public safety. But even though some may disagree with me here today, I don't think justice has ever been hidden. It requires holding those who break the law appropriately accountable. This should be a bipartisan issue, as Chase has said. But this often means holding someone appropriately accountable that if they break the law, they'll go to prison, they'll serve time on probation, or in appropriate circumstances, they'll even face death for particularly heinous crimes. But justice doesn't always have to include these types of punishments. Drug courts, veterans courts, domestic violence courts, all of these alternatives to incarceration can be appropriate punishments in certain circumstances. But accountability is the key. For these alternative programs to work, if someone won't get the help they need, if they can't get the help they need, then other punishments like jail or prison need to remain on the table. Too often today, when we talk about criminal justice reform, when we talk about criminal justice issues, there's no accountability for people who break the law. Now, contrary to popular belief, and I think we'll hear this during some of our panel discussions today, Few, if any, first-time nonviolent drug offenders are spending lengthy periods of time behind bars. It's just not happening. Most people in prison today are there for committing violent crimes, crimes like rape, robbery, and murder. So whenever you hear panelists today or elsewhere talk about reducing the prison population by 50%, 75%, or even 80% in some cases, keep in mind, that necessarily means reducing some repeat violent offenders back into our communities. But why are so many today eager to dismantle our criminal justice system? And again, I think we'll hear discussions about this throughout the panels today, but essentially, it's because many people have bought into two myths about our criminal justice system. They believe that we have a mass incarceration problem in our country, and we'll hear from one of our panels, differing views on that, but we don't. Mass incarceration is a myth. They've also bought into the myth that our criminal justice system is systemically racist. That's not true either. Individuals today are in prison not because of their race, but because they committed crimes, and they created victims. And sadly, whenever we talk about criminal justice issues, criminal justice reform today, victims are far too often the forgotten component of that conversation. I'll give an example. A recent proponent of the idea that mass incarceration is a problem, in his recent book, he said that incarcerated individuals have important stories to tell. And what's of primary importance to researchers, government officials, citizens, and presidents is the large number of these stories. But what about victims? Don't their stories matter too? So I hope that today, victims and their rights and their role in the criminal justice system will be a central part of our conversation. I also want to talk about the notion that there's such a thing as victimless crimes. You'll hear many who are supporter of the progressive prosecutor movement. As Chase mentioned, uh, I've, I and my colleague have termed it the rogue prosecutor movement. They say that there are so-called quality of life crimes that cannot be prosecuted because they're essentially victimless, and not prosecuting these crimes will not harm their communities. These are crimes like prostitution, petty theft, and most drug possession offenses, just to name a few. But a quick drive through cities where these crimes have gone unprosecuted will show that many of these cities are still grappling with the consequences of not prosecuting these offenses and holding offenders appropriately accountable. Crime and its consequences is another reason that we're seeing businesses in many cities across the country closing down. Soft on crime policies, again, that don't hold people appropriately accountable are wreaking havoc in communities across our country. And tragically, it's not only small offenses that are increasing as well, but you've also seen increases in shootings and homicides and other violent crimes in many cities too. And so I hope today that we'll hear from our panelists, including some of our elected district attorneys here, uh, who are supportive of those policies, that they'll address whether they believe these policies have helped or hurt their communities. 
And unfortunately, I think if you look at the real world consequences, the devastation and the other downstream effects of these policies will make the answer obvious. But quickly, I'd ask everyone today, as we're having many of these discussions and panels, that you keep two overarching questions in mind. One, how do we determine whether something is a good policy or bad policy? And second, and in some ways more importantly, who gets to decide what is a good policy or bad policy or what our criminal justice policy should be? For the reasons I've mentioned briefly, I think the first question answers itself. Soft on crime policies that don't hold people appropriately accountable don't benefit anyone, not even the offenders themselves. But who gets to decide these sensitive policy questions about what actions should constitute a crime? This is an area where I suspect there's disagreement. I'll give a hint, in my view, it's not the role of the district attorney to decide what should be a crime and what should not be a crime. It's the role of the people acting through their elected representatives in the legislature. The job of the district attorney is to faithfully enforce the law. By taking entire categories of crime off the table and refusing to prosecute them, uh, DAs are essentially substituting their own views for what the law should be and are violating their oaths of office to faithfully enforce the law. Our system of government doesn't work like that, and it should not work like that. When prosecutors refuse to do their duty, it affects everybody. Uh, I'm a former assistant United States attorney. Uh, my colleague, Cully Stimson, and I, we wrote a book on this topic, and I think it explains why many of these policies are harmful, and I look forward to the discussion surrounding that uh, today. So in closing, I want to echo what Chesa and John both said. I want to thank everyone for being here today to participate in this conference and for being willing to discuss these very important issues. But I hope, personally, at the end of the day, everyone will come away with a sense that there's really nothing to be unveiled. There's no secret to finding justice. It's not hidden. It requires, at bottom, holding offenders accountable for their actions. But unfortunately, as I think will become obvious, justice, in many instances, is being ignored in the service of larger ideological goals. And at the end of the day, that harms our communities, undermines the rule of law, and makes all of us less safe. I look forward to the conversation today. Thank you all. Hi, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Andrea Roth. I'm a member of the criminal law faculty here at UC Berkeley. And uh, I want to thank both the Heritage Foundation and the Berkeley Criminal Law and Justice Center for co-sponsoring this event. Um, and I'm really uh, excited to moderate our first panel of the day on uh, crime trends. So I think this is a good time for our panelists on the first panel to uh, come up and have a seat in front. And while they do that, I will read our standard Berkeley Law statement on academic freedom that we read at events such as this. Free speech and academic freedom are foundational values for the University of California. UC Berkeley is committed to the belief that speech we may not like or agree with should be confronted with respectful speech rather than censorship. UC Berkeley's principles of community call for civility and respect in our personal interactions. If you'd like to express a point of view that's different from what our guests present this uh, morning, you may do so in any area on campus that is open to public free speech. You, of course, may ask questions at the appropriate time. However, you're not permitted to disrupt the event. We ask that you as audience members be respectful, the speakers and students in attendance, and refrain from any disruptive behavior. If you attempt to disrupt the event, you will be asked to leave the venue and face possible student disciplinary action. Okay. So uh, before I introduce our panelists, let me say a word about the subject of the panel, which is broadly crime trends. So notwithstanding the heated s debate on the subject, which we'll hear a little bit more about in a minute, there's, uh, I would say, agreement on one point, uh, which is that crime is highly politically salient at the moment. Nationally, the percentage of both Republicans and Democrats, according to Pew, Doing crime as a priority issue has grown since 2021. It was mentioned in the State of the Union address this week. Locally, here in the Bay Area, San Francisco voters 
this week passed Proposition E, which grants police greater leeway to pursue suspects in vehicles, authorizes the use of drones and surveillance cameras, and reduces paperwork requirements in use of force cases. On this side of the bay, our progressive governor and attorney general just sent extra police and prosecutors, at least temporarily, to, quote, assist local efforts to restore a sense of safety, end quote, to the people of Oakland. And yet, whether this concern reflects reality, and if so, why it's happening and what to do about it are obviously hotly contested. And there are many different types of questions we could ask. What harm counts as what we call crimes? Which crimes get captured in statistics and which don't? How accurate are media portrayals and corporate reports of crime trends? What role does cognitive bias play in our perceptions of crime? What crimes are increasing or decreasing and why? When we look at year-to-date figures in Oakland citywide between 2023 and 2024, why have robberies gone up? Why, bur why have burglaries and auto thefts, rapes, and aggravated assaults gone down? These questions are not new, of course. They're centuries old, um, but they are newly urgent. And to discuss them, we have four of the most influential voices in the national discourse here with us today. So let me introduce them in the order in which they'll be speaking. So we have Barry Latzer, we have Jody Armour, Heather McDonald, and uh, Alec Karakitsanis. So Barry Latzer is an emeritus professor of criminal justice at John Jay College of Criminal Justice at uh, CUNY in New York. He's written six books and dozens of scholarly articles, research reports, and op-eds on this topic. Especially relevant to this panel are his histories of violent crime in the United States, including his 2016 book, The Rise and Fall of Violent Crime in America, and his 2021 book, The Roots of Violent Crime in America, from LSU Press. His most recent book is The Myth of Overpunishment from 2022. He received his PhD in political science from the University of Massachusetts and his JD from Fordham. And after law school, he briefly served as both a prosecutor in Brooklyn and a defense attorney for indigent defendants uh, in Manhattan. Professor Jody David Armour is the Roy P. Crocker Professor of Law at the University of Southern California, a widely published scholar and popular lecturer. He studies the intersections of race, law, morality, psychology, politics, ordinary language, philosophy, and the performing arts. His article, Race Ipsa Loquitur, of Reasonable Racists, Intelligent Bayesians, and Involuntary Negrophobes, has been a staple of 1L criminal law classes uh, since I was in law school, uh, which was in the 1900s. Uh, his latest book focused on the criminal system is, quote, N uh, uh, asterisk GGA theory, race, language, unequal justice in the law. He's a Soros Justice Senior Fellow of the Open Society Institute Center on Crime, Communities, and Culture. And he's on the board of directors for LEAP, uh, which is an international nonprofit of police, prosecutors, judges, correctional officials, and other law enforcement officials that are dedicated to criminal justice reform. Heather McDonald is the Thomas W. Smith Fellow at the Manhattan Institute and a contributing editor of City Journal. She's testified frequently in Congress and the Senate and has written several books on the criminal system, including the 2016 New York Times bestseller, The War on Cops, and the 2010 City Journal anthology, Are Cops Racist? She has a master's in English from Cambridge, where she was a Mellon Fellow, and a law degree from Stanford. Uh, after law school, she clerked for Judge Stephen Reinhardt on the Ninth Circuit, and she worked as an attorney advisor in the EPA Office of General Counsel and a volunteer with the Natural Resources Defense Council. She's received several awards from law enforcement and academic freedom focus groups for her work, including the 2022 Jean Kirkpatrick Award for Academic Freedom from Encounter Books. And finally, Alec Karakatsanis, who's the founder of the nonprofit Civil Rights Corps, which is engaged across the country in impact litigation and policy advocacy on systemic criminal issues, uh, perhaps most famously money bail, but not just money bail. Before that, he was a local public defender for the Special Litigation Division of the Public Defender Service for the District of Columbia. He was a federal public defender in Alabama and also founder of the nonprofit Equal Justice Under Law. He's received numerous awards for his litigation and policy advocacy work. He's appeared on The Daily Show. He typically gives more than 100 lecture speeches, training, interview, and workshops per year. Uh, he's a 20, uh, 2008 graduate of Harvard Law and the author of the 2019 book, Usual Cruelty, the Complicity of Lawyers in the Criminal Injustice System from uh, the New Press. So uh, 
uh, each speaker will speak for five to ten minutes. Then I will ask them some questions to give them a chance to engage with each other. And then we will try to make sure to leave 20 or 30 minutes for questions from the audience uh, at the end. So please join me in welcoming our four panelists. And Barry will have the floor first. And let me make sure that we've got the PowerPoint slides all set. Give me one more minute for a technical. Carolyn, could I ask a quest real quick question? Thank you. Barry, are these yours? Let's see. Let me just make sure I've got it right. I'm not used to seeing here. They're going to rest. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. They're going to rest with me. <laughs> Both of us. <laughs> just, just. Thank you, Andrea. Very kind introduction. Thanks to Chessa and thanks to John Yu. Where are you, John? Uh, for organizing this. Uh, it's very exciting. I'm really very pleased to be here. Uh, And what I want to discuss uh, really is sort of the, the foundation, I suppose, of uh, our panel, and that's uh, crime trends. Uh, and, and I'm going to go back a ways, but later on in my remarks, I'm going to focus mainly on the last few years, because they're always of most significance to us. We tend to focus rather narrowly. By the way, one reason I wrote crime histories was because I thought not too many people have done it, and it's important to understand the present, to look back at what happened in the 20th century, for instance, and although I went back further than that. So let's get started. I want to differentiate crime booms and crime spikes. So spikes are short term a year, two years. Crime booms last a much longer time. And booms, in fact, could last even for 25 years. For instance, what I call the great crime tsunami in the United States ran from the late 1960s to the early 1990s. That's a very long period of time. It was the biggest sustained increase in violent crime in the 20th century. And if I had better data, I would try to prove that it was the biggest crime boom in American history. But data before the 20th century are not really very reliable. I prepared this uh, graph to show you what the crime booms of the 20th century and the crime troughs. When crime goes down, we call it a crime trough. I wanted to show you what they look like. Now, these are homicides. And of course, that's defined, as the law students all know, as a person killing another human being. That may not be murder. It could be an accident. So it may not be treated as a murder, although sometimes you'll see it called murder in these uh, charts. It's homicide, technically speaking. So you could see that. In the early part of the 20th century, going up to the early 1920s, we had quite a crime boom. Let me see if this has a pointer. Does this have a pointer? No. That's all right, Henry. They'll be able to see. So you can
Amazing to me, I've seen books discussing incarceration that essentially ignore the crime movement. Unbelievable. They were trying to argue that incarceration really is not seriously or significantly related to crime. Really? No, that's not true. The great crime boom is what set off the huge increase in incarceration in the United States. And with good reason, people were terrified. Now here are the there's a bird's eye view, I suppose you have a close-up view of the crime tsunami. And here again you can see how crime went up until the early 80s. It started to sink, but then it went back up again in the late 80s. What happened? Crack cocaine. Crack cocaine in the late 80s and early 90s set the violent crime rates soaring again. Starting in the middle 90s, though, the crime rates went down. And you can see there were spikes. Again, booms versus spikes. You can see there were spikes in when? 2020, pandemic year. 2021, second pandemic year. And since, crime has been going down. I'm not arguing that the pandemic by itself uh, caused the spikes. It's more complicated than that. It has to do with the police reaction to the pandemic. It has to do with gang fighting. It has to do with the criminal justice system sort of backing off in terms of handling offenders and therefore encouraging more crime. It's more complicated than just saying, oh, the pandemic caused it. So here we have murder rates in 2019 to 2023. And this vividly in, uh, uh, depicts the effect of the pandemic and the allied causes of crime. So in 2019, the murder rate was just 5.1 per 100,000, and it spiked, and I use that word, of course, intentionally, to 6.8 and then 6.8 again in 2021. Starts to go down a little in 2022, and by 2023, the estimate is 5.6 per 100,000. In other words, crime, violent crime rate is going down. Now, you could say to me, but you're not showing the whole violent crime rate, you're only showing the homicide. And that's because violent crimes, half of them are not reported to the police. So if we rely, as we do, on police data for violent crime, we're not going to get accurate data because so many are not reported. Whereas, when it comes to homicide, there's a dead body, we're going to know about it, and therefore that's the most accurate measure of violent crime. And as you would expect, there is a correlation between homicides and other violent crimes. Not perfect but enough for us to be able to say crime, violent crime, is going up or down. Now let me go back one. All right, there's the year-to-date murder count. And I added a red flag that motor vehicle thefts seem to be rising and not going down, unlike the rest of all right, so I conclude with my uh, forecast, my prediction, always risky, of course, because you never can be sure of what will happen. My forecast is that crime is going to remain low until the next spike, year or two spike, but that we will not be in a crime boom. Now, Andrea, how much time do I have? I don't want to exceed my limits. I have to stop, right? I have a few more minutes to discuss. A couple minutes? A couple minutes? Yeah. Thank you. So to answer the question, why we're not going to have a crime boom, I began looking at the previous crime boom, that is the crime tsunami. The crime tsunami, as I analyze it, and this is in my book, Rise and Fall of Violent Crime in America, the crime tsunami was caused by three key facts. One, the so-called 
baby boomers, that's me, came of age in terms of criminality in the late 1960s, by and large. <coughs> by and large. So we can see what happened here. Young males increased 29% in the in 1960s and 43% in the 1970s. Now, young males do most of the violent crime. This is no surprise. This is no great insight. But when you have a big demographic bulge of young males, you will naturally have an increase in crime, just because of that alone. It's not sufficient to explain it, by the way. All of the analysts say that. But it's certainly a big fact. Now, why won't we have another crime group? Well, certainly the demographics don't favor it. We baby boomers are agents, the old and gray, and old timers don't do a lot of violent crime. And look at the projections for young males. 2025, they're 4.53% of the US population will be. By 2050, they're only 4.22% of the population. And these don't sound like big changes to you, I realize that. But that we're talking about millions of people. By 2060, they're 4.1%. In other words, the young population is, is shrinking as a percentage of the US population. And the older ones are increasing. This has become common knowledge, really. But it means no crime boom based on demographics. Second cause, this is the controversial one. We had a huge migration of African Americans from the south to northern cities. Now you know about the Great Migration, which primarily occurred initially in the 1920s. And it was triggered by jobs opening due to World War I. And of course, conditions in the south. The South, by the way, was very poor, not just the African-American population, the white population, extremely poor. And the economy of the South, which was totally dependent on agriculture, collapsed in the 1920s. So this was a big push factor, as the demographers call it, in the crime, I'm sorry, in the black migration. But the black migration increased in much greater respect after World War II, not just World War I, after World War II, the total black migration was 4.5 million people, and the black population of the Northeast nearly doubled between 1950 and 1970. Now, why is that significant to this discussion? Because, for reasons that would take us a whole day to go through, the black violent crime rates were very, very and these rates were high in the south, and then when the black population migrated to the north and to the cities of the north, they brought their high violent crime rates with them. i just give you a few examples here. Over a 20 year span from 1976 to 1995, African Americans who were only 12% of the US population committed a majority of the criminal homicides in the United States. Moreover, Almost the majority, about 48, 49% of all the victims of homicide were African Americans. Secondly, they made up 65 to 78% of all murder arrests in central cities in the United States. There's a lot of other data supporting the high violence crime rates of the African American population. Notwithstanding, and that I'm not going to go into all that, there's no question, in my mind at least, that the migration of African Americans to the North contributed to the big crime boom starting in the late 60s. Now, why won't there be another crime boom? One reason is we're seeing a reverse rate migration. African Americans are going back to the South. In the first graphic, 1990, I'm sorry, 1965 to 1970, the states colored here in a kind of pale orange are states that lost black population. And the states with the darker shadings are states that gained African-American population. 
So this is the migration of the 60s and the 70s. But look what happens in the 90s and 2000s. The South gains black population in those years, and the North loses black population. And that continues right up to 215 to 2020. So we're seeing a reverse migration. And again, we could do a whole conference on why that is the case. So therefore, the second explanation for the crime boom is not present. African Americans are going back to the South. Finally, the third explanation is the collapse or near collapse of the criminal justice system. When crime rose in the late 60s, the system was caught flat. -footed. Fewer people were arrested, even though crime was rising. Fewer people went to prison. The sentences and time served actually diminished. I mean, it's really startling when you see these numbers in light of the big crime boom that was taking place. So what do you think happened? Well, when the criminal justice system became weaker, of course, there was more incentive to do crime. Obviously, there were fewer punishments. This is the ratio of adult prison commitments to serious crimes to arrests for serious crimes. In other words, how many people arrested for serious crimes actually went into prison? 1960, roughly 300 out of every thousand, right? 299. 1965, it starts to decline, 261. By 1970, that figure is reduced to 170. In other words, for every thousand people arrested for a serious violent crime, only 170 did prison time in 1970. Now the decarcerationists ignore this. They ignore the fact that the system was essentially collapsing. It was falling apart. It couldn't deal with the huge, massive, and really sudden rise in, in violent crime. Only in the 70s, and especially in the 80s, did the system start to reconstitute itself, start to be able to grapple with this huge crime. So now, we don't see that. We don't see the system collapsing. We may see, and people will argue, that the system, that there's some red flags, that people are adopting policies that are undercutting the system. And that's going to be one of the big debating points in this country. But we don't see a collapse of the system in the face of the crime spikes that we have in, in the past few years. So therefore, I would argue, we don't have evidence that a crime boom is going to occur. Will spikes occur? Sure. Will a boom occur? I don't think so. Would I bet on that? Well, not a lot of money. <laughs> All right, Jody, take it away, mm -hmm. and let's see if there's a way to. Thank you. Do you? No. no. Okay. I think. Let's just try. This. Yes. Okay. Sorry. Oh. That's I know. All right. We're talking about crime trends. I understood that to be the call of the question. And I'm going to focus not just on homicides, because that leaves out a lot of important information about violent crime rates. I don't know how you leave out consideration of things like rape, aggravated assault, <coughs> robbery, you know, if you're talking about crime trends. So when I looked at the data for today's discussion, it, one thing that was clear in 2022, we had the fourth lowest 2022 was the fourth lowest for violent crime in 50 years. 2023, near the lowest year for violent crime in 50 years, lower than 70s, 80s, 90s, all of those, as you saw with some of the charts up there with respect to homicide, but with violent crime, it's even more pronounced. 
Uh, places like New York City, LA, Chicago, Houston, all had some form of bail, some form of bail reform for at least three years. And Philly had limited use of bail. And you saw crime rates going down, violent crime rates going down during that time. Freedom was up and homicides and, and violent crime in particular were down between 11% and 21% in those major cities. Nevertheless, given all of those trends and all that good news from that standpoint, a Gallup poll in 2023 found that 92% of Republicans, 58% of Democrats thought crime was rising, while 77% thought it was worse than a year ago. And we know in 2022 it was better than the year before that. 2023, rather, was better than in 2022. Let's talk about property crime. You know, we're not just concerned about homicides. Everyone's concerned about property crime, too. It's been making a lot of news. Property crime in 2023 fell to its lowest level since 1961, a 52-year low. Burglary, larceny, arson, etc. All right? The um, reason you might not know that is there was this thing, this moral panic called the retail theft moral panic. Right, the hit, the news, a lot of us were hearing about it. Um, and they were very kind of sensationalistic stories and some video that, um, that hit the airwaves. Uh, and there was a lot of even legislation that came out of that. And so I wanted to, again, I went to the gray lady New York Times, December 8, 2023, to get a handle on this retail crime panic, right? You had people like, um, oh, um, Donald Trump saying his master plan for solving the shoplifting crisis was if you rob a store, you can fully expect to be shot as you're leaving. All right, Governor Newsom pledged 300 million new dollars to fight what was the retail theft crisis, and in the process, cutting $40 million from the public defense budget. Charles Grassley staged a fight retail crime event on Capitol Hill, it's all 2023, at which he stood next to the National Retail Federation executives to push a bipartisan bill to create a center to combat organized retail crime in the Department of Homeland Security. Right, Washington Post editorial board jumped on board and said Congress had to pass the Grassley measure. Right, um, so I went to the great lady just to see, along with some other sources, of what there was, if there was any support for it. And the national lobbying group that was behind it retracted its startling estimate. It said there was $94.5 billion of shrink. Shrink includes external theft, internal theft, processing losses, all kinds of things. Nine of that $94 billion in, in shrink, they said nearly half of that was attributable to retail theft. These, you know, theft gangs going in and, 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 and doing all of this marauding. Well, then they dug a little. You remember that happened in with Walgreens in San Francisco, by the way. And then the San Francisco uh, uh, Chronicle followed up and said, no, no, actually, some of these stores that were pulling out were experiencing two shoplifting incidents a month at most. And it didn't square up. That was just with Walgreens. This, um, on a more national level, the uh, group that had started this panic uh, retracted and said that organizing groups likely responsible, organized groups of any kind were likely responsible not for 50% of the 94.5 billion, but for 5%. 5%, not 50%, right? Um, and those are the kinds of lies and hoaxes that lead to these panics and this kind of turn to mass incarceration. Um, a lot of it was blamed on, um, by the way, Proposition 
47. A lot of people turned to Proposition 47 and started scapegoating Proposition 47 for the retail theft crisis. They started doing that in Sacramento, right? Bunk, 100 percent, all right? Um, and yet it was driving our, our criminal justice uh, policy. Let's go on, I, I can go, uh, if I have time, talk about a lot more debunked stories along the same lines, but let's talk, continue talking about crime trends since that's the topic, right, of, of discussion, that's the call of the question. Let's talk about uh, crime trends, some of the hidden trends that we don't talk enough about as much about. What about wage theft? Right, Alec talks very eloquently about these kinds of issues. Uh, illegal pollution, illegal eviction, fraudulent foreclosure, tax evasion, those don't get counted, right? What, what about the crime rates there? What about the, the crime trends there? One trillion dollars a year, uh, the last <laughs> estimate I looked at, one trillion dollars a year from tax evasion. Think about what we could do with a trillion dollars a year to address a lot of our issues in this country, to address a lot of the suffering, relieve a lot of the suffering that many of us are worried about. Uh, the media overemphasizes a small subset of overall crime in its public safety coverage, leaving people anxious about certain kinds of harm and in the dark about other important safety issues. Right? Um, Let's talk about another kind of hidden trend of crime. The New York City is facing an epidemic of police misconduct. Complaints against police are up 51% in 2023. Are those included in anybody's graphs? $114 million paid out just in verdicts for misconduct in 2023. Um, far worse than before George Floyd, by the way, police killed in 2023 um, 1,232, three people a day. Again, trend worse than before uh, the George Floyd um, um, issues that arose and, and protests, et cetera. Finally, let's talk about one other big trend before we get to the, 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 the key issue I want to kind of hit on here. And that is the trend across many big cities that, that are facing budget deficits and cutting services that could help ameliorate the crime problem because electeds give big raises to police, despite overall, right, big raises in LA, big raises in Dallas, in Houston, go right around the country, big raises creating deficits, causing cuts in all other places on the budget. In New York, Eric Adams is, is notorious for this, cuts all, all these other important parts of the budget to give the, po the police um, raises despite an overall drop in crime that we were talking about, despite crime going down in the way I just talked about, and despite lower clearance rates. This is the one I really want to talk about police crime clearance rates, right? The, Subaru, the Center on Juvenile Justice went to some data from California Department of Justice and the Office of the State Controller. Let's talk about just Cali for a moment here. And what they found was that the clearance rate, which is a key indicator of how well police are doing their jobs, right? The clearance rate for California between 1990 and 1992, rather 1990 and 2022, during the past three decades, the percentage of reported violent and property crimes solved by police through an arrest. This has nothing to do with the prosecution, through the arrest. Right, and then we can get to the prosecution for a, a, a moment later. Through an arrest, that the um, percentage of reported violent property crimes solved by police through an arrest dropped by a whopping 41%. During the same three decades, the amount California taxpayers spend to fund law enforcement has risen a staggering 52%. Clearance rates going this way, spending on police going this way. All right, uh, the police, uh, uh, the author and senior researcher talked about the number of reported crimes to police have plunged about 50%. The reported crimes have plunged 
50% over this time period. So the police have fewer crimes to have, that they have to solve, yet their clearance rate is still going down. As we're spending more money on them, as the spending is going way up, and we're strapping municipalities to pay for ineffective policing. Um, San Francisco and Alameda County are home of some of the state's loudest calls for more cops and more policing, yet San Francisco has a dismal clearance rate of 6.7%, and Al Alameda County, 5.8%. This is the police. They, they got to bring the cases to the DAs. They're not getting the cases to the DAs. Um, the, according to the, some of the, a few more key findings, then I'm done, because this is, this for me, I, I was so glad that I was invited to talk because I hadn't dove into this data before and really seen what was going on, had a chance to see what was going on. Um, key findings of the report are police are consuming more public resources than ever before, but sol solving fewer crimes, that's the upshot. Keep coming back to billions of dollars in additional spending for police corresponding to decreasing effectiveness. I would hope that both the right and left want good returns on our investment dollars. That should be something we can all agree on. And it's not happening with our police de uh, department. Um, it's not close to. 1990 clearance rates have plummeted. Since 1990, clearance rates have plummeted in California for rape, aggravated assault, burglary, motor vehicle theft, and larceny theft offenses. Okay, yes, during that time period, rates for clearance rates for homicide rose 1%. So if you just focus on homicide, you miss all that. And they rose for robbery by 16%, but in all those other categories that plummeted. California is now more likely, by the way, to imprison someone arrested by law enforcement than they were in 1990. It's not that they're not getting prosecuted, which is what often the claim. They're more likely to get the rate of imprisonment per clear, that is, so, so violent and property felon, has risen by 207 percent since 1990. Right, and I'm going to wrap up with this. Reporter Klein has fallen steeply, leaving far fewer crimes for police departments to solve, yet the clearance rates are plummeting. In spite of all that, the odds of imprisonment per clear case have increased, not decreased, over the last 35 years. So when we start talking about ineffective prosecution, come back to that fact over and over again. That has not been the case, factually. We need to, we need to return to facts and receipts for a change. Right, rather than vibes, which seems to be the homo vibe rate that everyone wants to base policy on. Um, and I will get, I, I have a lot more here. We can get to it hopefully during the questions. All right, Heather McDonald. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me here. I'm honored to the Berkeley Law School to be a, a member of the symposium. And the, the hope for uh, goal of this, which is sort of hands across the waters, it's already happened because Professor Armour and I have both agreed that uh, the whole textualism, originalism conceit is linguistically incoherent. So we're going to hope to uh, to sort of be, be conspirators in that, in that uh, discussion after, the, after our panel. Um, and I'm going to address some of the questions that Professor Armour took up, uh, which are also those that a Peeve Press Corps has been asking recently, which is why are Americans so benighted uh, when it comes to crime? As NPR put it in February, quote, violent crime is dropping fast in the U.S., even if Americans don't believe it. In 2023, proclaimed NPR, quote, Amer crime in America looked very different from previous years, end quote. And yet the public, as Professor Armour noted, was not buying it. 77% of Americans polled last November thought that there was more crime in 2023 than in 2022. 63% felt that crime was either very or extremely serious. 65% of Californians, including 70% of Latinos and 69% of blacks, fear becoming a crime victim. 
and 73% of Los Angelinos fear for their persons and property. An irritated Washington Post cult, uh, cult, culture reporter recently sneered at the public's response to a zombie CVS store in Washington, D.C., whose shelves had been stripped bare, and like Professor Armour, she scoffed at the, quote, America's latest moral panic, this one over shoplifting. Such a moral panic was ironic, she noted, given that America is a, quote, sticky-fingered nation built on stolen land. The implication, sometimes stated outright, is that there is something unseemly, and let's be frank, racist, about the public's stubborn concern with lawlessness. I want to suggest two answers to the question why Americans are not celebrating. First, the scale of last year's decrease does not begin to make up for the post-George Floyd and post-Michael Brown crime spikes. The FBI estimates that violent crime dropped by 8% in 2023. That estimate is based on a half a year of data and excludes the high crime summer months. It is not yet definitive. In 2022, the National Crime Victimization Survey showed a large rise in violent crime while the FBI was showing a slight decrease. This same large divergence between experienced and reported crime could be happening again in 2023. But even if the FBI's 2023 estimates hold up, that 8% is dwarfed by the crime surge that began with the George Floyd riots in 2020. And here I disagree with Professor Latzer. I don't think that that crime surge was due primarily to the pandemic, except to the extent that courts were closed down. Uh, the data simply does not bear this out. The United States is the only place that had a crime surge of violent crime. Europe, South America, crime plummeted. Every category of crime plummeted during the pandemic and lockdowns. Only in the United States did we have this massive crime increase, and I would argue that the reason for that was the lack of adequate response to the George Floyd riots uh, and the demoralization of the police. So let's compare uh, pre-George Floyd riots in 2022 with our current status. According to the Council on Criminal Justice, the homicide rate was 18% higher in 2023 than it was in 2019. The gun assault rate was 32% higher. Carjacking was 93% higher. Motor vehicle theft surged by 105%. Individual cities showed as dramatic and as enduring a rise. In Chicago, Total crime was up 55% from 2019 to 2023. Robbery was up 38% and car theft was up 227%. In Memphis, homicides were up 87% in 2023 compared to 2019. This 2019 benchmark masks an even more dramatic rise in crime. The surge that began with the first iteration of what I've called the Ferguson effect. After the Michael Brown shooting and resulting riots in 2014, the police backed off of proactive policing and criminals became emboldened. The national homicide rate in 2022 was 40% higher than in 2014. So whatever decreases there were in 2023, they are certainly not large enough to wipe out the post-2019 and post-2014 increases. The second reason why Americans are not getting with the program is that they regularly see and experience a slow motion version of the anarchy of the George Floyd riots. Let's recall some recent episodes, uh, what Professor Armour calls sensationalism. In January, during a street takeover in Compton, California, a 13-year-old repeatedly rammed a stolen Kia into the security gates of a bodega until he broke down the store's defenses. At least 100 people swarmed into the premises to ransack it, stealing 40,000 worth of meat scales, lottery tickets, and groceries. The 13-year-old was arrested and immediately released, after which he went on to commit a string of other burglaries in Compton and nearby Carson. At the Topanga Mall in Los Angeles this summer, a horde of thieves in ski masks attacked the security guards at a Nordstrom's with bear spray. 
They smashed the display cases with sledgehammers, tore apart shelving, and dragged display cabinets to the front of the store. In minutes, they had made off with more than $100,000 in merchandise as employees looked on helplessly and closed sensor alarms rang throughout the store. Last August, thieves methodically smashed the windows of a long line of cars parked at San Francisco's Fisherman's Wharf. A female had her purse snatched from her hands through one of those broken windows while she was sitting in her car. There were nearly 1,670 such car break-ins in San Francisco that month. It's hard to decide which is more shocking, the violent assaults on store infrastructure and employees or the confident shoplifting ramble. We've all seen the videos of thieves making a leisurely stroll through the aisles, shoving into a 50-gallon trash bag, shoving items into a 50-gallon trash bag and unhurriedly exiting the store. Last month, three vandals broke into a Gucci store in the meatpacking district of New York City. The female looter was so blasé that she didn't bother with a mask, even though she and her fellow vandals ordered the employees to get on the floor at gunpoint and stuffed nearly $60,000 in goods into a brown sack before escaping through the Lincoln Tunnel. That confidence comes from one thing, the knowledge that mass stealing will bring little to no consequences. Our criminal justice elites have decided that they would rather subject the property of honest businessmen to mass expropriation than to apprehend and punish looters because doing so has a disparate impact on minority criminals. These are not crimes of necessity, they are crimes of opportunity. The perpetrators of mass looting, flash mobs, and gang wars virtually all have smartphones with which they communicate their plans and show off their booty. Social media is law enforcement's greatest helper in solving crime. No one who has a smartphone is poor. No one engaged in these crimes is unable to eat. Rather, the predatory theft comes from a sense of entitlement. If others have something that I don't have, I am entitled to take it. We should not acclimate ourselves to a world where the trivial items of life, aspirin, shampoo, and lotion, need to be locked up behind plexiglass barriers if there are any such items even left in our neighborhood drugstore. This is not a normal state. It is due to a failure of will, the will to enforce the values of civilized society. The breakdown of law and order is the result of policy choices. Several years ago, I interviewed people in Southern California homeless encampments about Proposition 47. That California law, as Professor Armour mentioned, heralded a wave of decriminalization measures that have since swept the country. Prop 47 reclassified many property and drug felonies to misdemeanors, and in so doing, freed hardcore criminals from probation or parole supervision. In the heart of Los Angeles' Skid Row, I spoke to the self-described, quote, mayor of San Julian Park, who is passing out social service flyers. Prop 47 had led to the, quote, WDNC phenomenon, he said, translated as, we do not care. Quote, people say, what can they do to me? Everyone knows they're not going to prison. Even if they commit a violent crime, the DA may let them ple plea out and they're back on the streets. It is not a moral panic to be concerned about the lawlessness that has broken out since 2020. It is realism. Public sees that lawlessness every time another store is looted and another criminal is set free after an assault to attack again. Store owners and private property owners report just the barest fraction of property crimes because they know that the police will likely not show up and if the police do show up, nothing will happen next. The wave of store and restaurant closings in California and elsewhere is not due to competition from online retailers, as was asserted at last month's Racial Justice Act conference here at the Berkeley Law School. In-N-Out Burger and Denny's were not facing online competition when they closed their outlets in Oakland near Oakland Airport recently. They closed because they could not guarantee the safety of their employees and customers, quote, our customers and employees are regularly victimized by car break-ins, theft, and armed robberies, said an In-N-Out representative. Clorox, which is headquartered in Oakland, has hired security guards to escort its employees to and from work.
Though the store closings to date are due overwhelmingly to uncontrolled theft, the spirits killing squalor of shopping in the age of mass expropriation, the need to wait minutes for a jailer, I mean a store clerk, to liberate the Advil from the plexiglass prison if the clerk shows up at all, will most certainly drive more retail customers into the waiting arms of commerce. The post-George Floyd race riots, uh, rise in violent street crime has been startling, and as usual, in violent street crime has been startling, and as usual taken its biggest toll on black victims. Black juveniles are now shot at 100 times the rate of white juveniles. Blacks between the ages of 10 and 24 die of gun homicide at nearly 25 times the rate of whites in that age cohort. The shooters are overwhelmingly not the police and not whites, but other blacks. For that reason, the media and the Black Lives Matter activists turn their eyes away. If whites were gunned down at that rate, there would be a national revolution. Government's most basic responsibility is to guarantee a zone of security so that citizens can engage in a whole range of transactions, including offering, offering services and goods without fear. When government abdicates that responsibility, what is the public supposed to do? Now, cities from San Francisco to Baltimore, as, as Professor Roth mentioned, are reversing many of their anti-law enforcement policies. Uh, California, uh, Gavin Newsom is sending in, and, and California Attorney General Rob Bonta are sending in California Highway Patrol officers, license plate readers, specialized units, and state prosecutors to bolster criminal prosecution in Alameda County. Washington, D.C. just voted to make city carjackings easier to prosecute and to create a new felony for organized retail theft. San Francisco, as Professor Roth mentioned, is expanding police powers, and New York Governor Kathy Hochul has announced that she's sending in the National Guard to patrol the New York subways. These are signs of a needed course correction. But the public will not believe that crime is really dropping until it sees order restored and repeat criminals rather than toothpaste put under lock and key. Thank you for your attention. Last but not least, Eric Car uh, Alec Caracasanas. Hi everyone. Can y'all hear me in the back? Great. The speaker before me was asking all of the wrong questions and giving you all of the wrong answers. I want, before I begin, to distance myself in the strongest possible terms from some of what has been said by the speaker before me and from the way in which the second speaker in the opening introduction framed today's conversation. I also want to just share, before I begin, a few of my own biases. I'm not coming to this conversation as an objective thinker, as someone who claims to have all of the answers, as someone who is entirely sure that their point of view is correct. I think it's important to me to share how I became so passionate about and interested in the questions and the work that have animated my career. And that question in, can be phrased in many ways, but in, in the broadest terms, I view that work as trying to figure out how, as a society, we can create a world and create communities in which the greatest number of human beings can flourish and live lives that they want to live with their families and their friends in as, with as much freedom and liberty as they can. And for me, I approached that work um, by taking a job in the punishment bureaucracy as a public defender. And so everything that I'm about to say and talk about is colored by my career representing some of the poorest people in our society who are being thrust into a punishment bureaucracy, and I use that term intentionally. I don't call it a criminal justice system because I don't think either its purpose or its effect is justice. I don't call it a public safety system because I don't think it's keeping us safe. I call it 
a criminal punishment bureaucracy. Because as a libertarian, I see that system as a massive government and corporate bureaucracy that is pursuing goals that are fundamentally disconnected from the goals that it's articulating to us in public. And, and so I want to just share that my bias is coming from someone who has been fighting on a very particular side in this battle. My clients are all impoverished people. My clients for my entire career have been people who are being caged, who are being deported, who are living in communities from which we have divested, whose families are unable to meet the basic necessities of human life, whose children are struggling to have the things that I had when I grew up. And so my perspective is really skewed and biased, and I understand that, and I need you to, as you hear my remarks, understand that I'm coming from that very particularly biased place. And so I don't think it, that many people in the room will agree with everything I say, but it's all driven from uh, at least what I experienced to be a very well-meaning attempt to devote my life to making the world a little bit more equal and a little bit more just. I think the remarks that came directly before me are a sophisticated and uh, I think unfortunately effective form of propaganda. In 1962, the great French scholar Jacques Ellul wrote what is still probably the most significant and profound study of the concept of propaganda. And Ellul traced Hitlerian propaganda, Stalinist propaganda, and US corporate marketing propaganda, and culled from each of those dominant forms of propaganda, the fascist propaganda, the communist and, and statist communist propaganda, and the capitalist American post-war propaganda, culled from each of those several important lessons. I don't have time to go into them all now, but I highly encourage you all, anyone interested in propaganda, to read Jacques Ellul's work. One point he made, which is particularly salient in my mind after listening to some of what's been said, is that the best propaganda, whether it's Hitler or Stalin or American corporations, is based on true facts. If you lie to people, it's not very effective propaganda in the long term because people stop believing what you say. But if you tell them true facts in a way that causes them to have manipulated and skewed and false interpretations and perceptions of the world, then you can be engaged in really effective propaganda. What do I mean by that? And by the way, there's a caveat to this, which is that if you lie about things that people don't have access to, then you can maybe get away with it. But if you lie about things that people have some ability to verify, your propaganda is not going to be effective. And that is why Hitler himself was very clear, Goebbels himself, very clear in their public and private writings that it was essential that any facts asserted in their propaganda be true as much as possible, at least on things that people could verify. So, we've just heard a litany of facts, some of which were not true, but some of which are probably true. Uh, the, you know, March 9th theft from Walgreens that was captured on video, the April 4th physical assault outside a courthouse, whatever the, the, the stuff that was just read, these are potentially true facts. But using true facts in a particular way enables you to deceive people. It enables you to deceive people in profound ways that shape all of our lives. Let me give you an example. Uh, there was a Walgreens theft from San Francisco that was captured on video. Somewhat brazen theft. A um, person hopped on a bicycle and rode out of the store. Went viral. Tens of millions of people saw this. In the 28 days after that theft was captured on video, there were 309 national news stories about that theft alone. Were those news stories based on a false um, event? Did that not occur? Well, no. They were covering something that happened in the world. But they created a false impression that shoplifting was out of control when shoplifting was actually down, when property crime was down, 
when property crime was at historic lows. Imagine it like this. If, if you have um, City A um, in year 2020, and there are, let's say, 50 homicides. And of those 50 homicides, the local news does 40 stories that year about homicide. Then you have City B. Um, let's just keep just the same city the following year. There are 30 homicides. So homicide went down from 50 to 30. But of those 30 homicides in the same city the following year, there were 170 news stories about them or 365 news stories about them, one story a night, or 1,000 news stories about them, three stories a night. In which year in City A do you think the public is gonna think homicide is rising? This is how you manipulate people's perceptions and interpretations and intuitions using true facts. It's easy to combat the lies. You know, we could, we could go through people's writing and people's speeches and we could dissect uh, what things did they say are true and what things are untrue. So some of what was said before about Prop 47 is a lie, right? It's been studied. It's been studied ex extensively by experts in econometrics, by political scientists, by economics professors, by conservatives, by progressives, by radical people. Um, Everyone understands that Prop 47 did not increase crime in California. So some things are just easily disprovable nonsense. But other things are a little bit more difficult to, to um, both define and to combat. And that is when um, the propaganda is based on things that are true. Because then it requires critical thinking skills. It requires framing the right questions so that you can provide the right, right answers. Okay. So I think that is, for me, the starting point for trying to understand and talk about something like crime trends. Because the discourse on crime is so heavily manipulated that most people in our society have utterly lost their way when they're thinking about what public safety means. Instead of thinking about underlying deep metrics like life expectancy, right? like some of the surveys that go into the UN Development Index, some of the, the, the um, broad sort of social, political, economic, personal uh, factors that go into uh, the World Bank's evaluation of their development programs in other countries, for example. These are really complex questions that scholars think and talk a lot about. In the crime discourse in the US, the concept of safety has been reduced to five or seven index crimes that police record. It's an utterly, it would be, you would be laughed out of the room in any corporate bank, in any insurance company, in any international development context, if you tried to capture something as complex and nuanced and varied and important as public safety with literally one of the worst possible sets of metrics imaginable. So let me just um, describe, I think, two of the many, but maybe probably the two most important big lies or deceptions or myths that are happening at a macro level when we talk about crime trends, when we talk about public safety. And again, I'm coming to this as a libertarian person who is generally opposed to large bureaucracy. Um, but I think there are some aspects of what large bureaucracies do, like collect some useful statistics that can be helpful and in us understanding some of the things that are happening in our society. So that number one, um, one of the things that the punishment bureaucracy has been incredibly effective at doing is narrowing, as I said, our conception of public safety. We now think about public safety as almost solely about things like uh, physical assault recorded by police, sexual assault recorded by police, homicide recorded by police, property theft by poor people recorded by police. Obviously, as Jody mentioned, the police don't even bother to record most of the theft that goes on in this country. About 99% of all theft in this country is not recorded as a crime by police. We're talking about a trillion dollars of tax evasion, $50 billion of wage theft, $800 billion in corporate fraud. There's, I could go on and on if you get the point. So 
Um, what are we thinking about when we think about public safety? Are we thinking about the number of people that are getting cancer because of illegal dumping and pollution, right? There are several million criminal violations of clean air and clean water laws in the country every single year, completely unrecorded by police, unprosecuted by prosecutors. These are things presumably the, the, the gentleman who opened the, the discussion would want accountability for. He'd want people to go to prison, right? This person wants people to go to prison for texting while driving, wants people to go to prison for illegal dumping, wants people to go to prison for using someone else's Netflix account, right? A prison is a solution for everything. Um, but you have to understand that because the punishment bureaucracy has narrowed our conception of safety, it is only looking for some crimes committed by some people co committed at some times. It is ignoring the vast bulk of criminality that people all over our society are committing at all times. The vast bulk of child sexual abuse, the vast bulk of rape, the vast bulk of theft, as I already mentioned, the vast bulk of environmental crimes are never recorded by police and never make it into the media. They never make it onto graphs about crime trends. And so when we think about how to create a society where people are safer, we have to have a much broader understanding of what metrics are we using to measure safety than police recorded index crimes. The vast majority of interpersonal harm and preventable death in this country comes from things that are either not considered criminal or are totally and utterly and completely and intentionally ignored by the criminal punishment bureaucracy. So that's the big myth number one is um, this sort of narrow conception of public safety, that our public safety in its most important uh, sort of conceptual, uh, is sort of its Aristotelian like uh, sort of being is uh, the thing that we're measuring by police statistics. It's just a lie. It's not the thing that we all care about. We care about are our loved ones living or dying? Are our loved ones getting cancer? Are our loved ones being sexually assaulted and abused? We don't care about police statistics about that. Okay, myth number one. Myth number two, and this is something that uh, unfortunately infused every presentation that we've heard today. Myth number two is that the criminal punishment bureaucracy has a significant effect on overall interpersonal harm in our society. Every large scale international and domestic study that has ever been done on the question has shown that interpersonal harm, and I use that term intentionally because I'm not talking about police recorded crime. I'm talking about interpersonal harm, people harming each other, okay? Every study that has ever been done on the topic has found that it is much more related to structural features of our society than it is to any particular policy tweak in the criminal punishment bureaucracy. So what do I mean by that? Well, if you study, um, let's say, uh, the prosecutorial policies of a given DA in a particular city, um, if you use the most sophisticated, randomized, controlled trial uh, methodology, um, you are almost never going to find that any of those policies has any statistically significant effect on crime. The ones that have been done that have found statistically significant effects recently are that not prosecuting misdemeanors decreases crime in the future. Those are the only studies that have had robust findings, and even those findings are relatively small. Okay. Why is that? If you study another thing that was mentioned earlier, court closures, another thing that was mentioned earlier, the supposed pullback by police, this sort of cartoonish Ferguson effect, none of these things have any basis at all in empirical literature. Zero, none, nothing, okay? If you study those things, what you find is that none of those policies impact big, long-term trends of how much people are hurting each other in our society. Those things are determined by big things like, do people have um, enough food? Do people have a place to live? Do people have access to health care? Do people have um, an extraordinary uh, imbalance in 
their economic opportunities? Are children getting early childhood education? These are the things that the long-term rigorous studies show impact how much people harm each other. Are they exposed to environmental toxins like lead? Right? The lead exposure in children actually determines more than any other criminal justice policy the amount of violent crime on a multi-decade uh, time span. Right? Each of those things are incredibly important factors, and they almost never feature in any conversation about public safety, either in conferences like this or in the news media. And why is that? And I think it's because the criminal punishment bureaucracy is not about and has never been about public safety. If police, prosecutors, and prisons made us safer, we would have the safest society in the history of the world. No other government has ever attempted to cage so many of its population as the United States right now in the history of the modern world. Okay, um, We are spending orders of magnitude more on police prosecutors and prisons than any other society in modern recorded world history, and yet we have some of the highest rates of interpersonal harm. Many other countries that invest far more in some of the systems I mentioned, and it goes well beyond what I mentioned. I'm just listing some of the structural factors. Obviously, there are a lot of other things like um, the strength of local communities and civil society, um, the, the, the alienation that people feel, et cetera, et cetera. But um, if you look at other countries where the strength of the social fabric is stronger, where they invest more in healthcare, housing, early childhood education, rental health care, et cetera, you have far lower rates of interpersonal harm. So this myth, and, and this myth is an insidious one because it infects virtually every time you open your computer and look at a news article about this issue. They're talking about some new DA policy or some propositions, some sentencing policy, some new judge who's lenient on bail, the whole issue of bail generally, right? It has almost no effect either way on how much people hurt each other in our society, which is about deeper things in our social structure. And, and I guess that leads, I, I, I've been told that my time is up, so I'll have to save some of the rest of this uh, stuff for um, if, I'm, if I'm invited back to, to answer any questions after this. Um, I guess it leads into one fundamental um, last sort of thing I wanted to leave you with. I was giving a talk uh, at Harvard, which was, um, uh, similarly um, uh, one-sided and, and um, biased. And um, a student came up to me afterward, a fellow libertarian from the Federalist Society. And he said to me, um, you know, I agree with every single thing you've said. You seem like more of an anarchist libertarian than I am, but <laughs> libertarian nonetheless. And, and I agree with everything that you said, except um, the fundamental difference between me and you is that I believe that human beings are inherently evil and we have to protect ourselves from each other. And I believe, like one of the speakers just before me said, the central role of government is to protect us from the evil of other people. And you seem to believe that human beings are inherently good. And we can all just get along. And that's why you're dangerous. And, um, and, I, and I thought a lot about that, because I think he's right. I think one of the main differences between me and a lot of people who I oppose on the other side of many of these debates is not that we, um, that, that we have some um, you know, different perception of the evidence, or we, we often do, but at its core, it's what is our view of human nature? Do we think that people are inherently evil? Or, and I think he was wrong about what I believe, was I, I don't have a position on whether we're inherently good as, as human beings, but I do think we have the ability and the power to create environments and to create structures that determine how we behave. I myself would probably not be here today if I had grown up in a different environment. I would probably not have the same beliefs that I have if I hadn't spent the beginning of my career as a public defender. I am a creature of the family that I grew up in, the schools that I went to, the investments that were made in me, the things that I've seen, the substances that I've consumed, 
um, all of the things that have happened in my life have changed my brain and my body chemistry. That's an example of how all of us are creatures of our environment. And our task as people who care about safety and public policy is to create the social structures and the environments that encourage people to live in harmony with each other, to help each other live flourishing lives. It's those investments that matter. And it's not that some people are more inherently evil than others, and, and that's not what's driving crime. These troughs and peaks, it's not that Americans were becoming more evil, less evil, more evil, less evil. It's not like a spike in crime means that people are all of a sudden more evil, right? There are knowable, and we know them, factors that all of the research from across the world for a century have shown determine whether we hurt each other or not. And so almost everything that you're going to hear today, and everything that you just heard from the person before me, is propaganda. Because it's meant to distract you from conversations about the investments that our society needs, and to focus your attention on expanding the size and power of the punishment bureaucracy. Because that bureaucracy, as I explain in my book, Usual Cruelty, <laughs> that bureaucracy's main function has never been about public safety or justice. That bureaucracy's main function is to expand control and profit and to ensure that our society maintains the levels of inequality that it has always had. Thank you. So normally this would be, thank you, Alec. Normally this would be the time when uh, I ask a few devastating questions of both sides, but uh, I see that we have five to 10 minutes left. So my thought is to open it up to the audience to see what questions you have. Um, if you have none, which I can't imagine, then I will jump in. I will enter the fray. And I don't know if we have mics for people who have, oh, great, okay. Anybody from the audience have a question for any of the panelists? All right, then I will jump into the fray. Uh, so one question for uh, Heather and Barry that uh, takes um, Alex's talk as a, as a starting point is, um, you know, this idea that we, crime is complicated and contingent and it can be very, very difficult to know what causes it and also what can make it uh, go down to the extent that harmful conduct is happening. And so, uh, you know, just go, to go back to 2021 to 2023, uh, on the San Francisco uh, uh, crime blotter, you see that from 2022, we've got a progressive prosecutor in San Francisco to now a more, relatively more, law and order prosecutor, uh, you have some of these uh, index crimes going up, like robbery and motor vehicle theft. Um, in Oakland, where you have a self-described progressive prosecutor, you have several index crimes going down. And I understand the idea that summer uh, increases crime uh, and that it's too early to tell exactly what the year to dates will be in December, but, but why would crime be lower if this were such a problem uh, f even in March compared to uh, what it was under other regimes? So I'm, I'm wondering, you know, if my reasonable conclusion from that is sort of like Alex, that we, we can't tell, uh, and we don't know what the effect is, if, uh, or you know, his view that there is no effect. Why is your conclusion, uh, notwithstanding those statistics, uh, that there is a clear effect, and why do you have such certainty about that? Well, first of all, with regards to property crime, it is just, it is the case that people are not reporting. Uh, you can talk to store owners, you can talk to people that have been victims of, of their personal property theft. They just feel there's no point. Uh, and police officers don't even show up to take reports often because they know that's not going to happen. As far as there being no studies of the effects of policing, I, I disagree with that. I think. Anthony Braga has done very good studies of, of hotspot policing that has shown 
that focused uh, policing. Even Robert Weisberg at Stanford once said there's nothing more important that police can do than, than uh, make stops for, as far as getting guns off the street. Um, and Professor uh, Karakatsanis mentioned that uh, claims there's no data on uh, depolicing. In fact, Paul Cassell has done some very good studies looking at the rate of police stops that have dropped massively after high profile police shootings uh, and, and has correlated those with, with uh, rates of crime. So, but that there are clearly not every single crime category goes in lockstep. Uh, I would say, as Professor Latimer mentioned, car theft is, is probably the best reported of, uh, property. of property crimes because of the insurance policies. And there again, you have very high, high rates of, of car theft that has been going up steadily since the George Floyd race riots. May I make a comment? Yes, please. I think the people that Alec suggests he's most concerned about are most concerned about being mugged on the way to their jobs, on the way to their schools, on the way to their homes. In other words, they're concerned, Alec, about violent crime as we've defined it. Why aren't you concerned about that? Why must you broaden everything to the point where the definition of crime becomes so am, uh, ambiguous, so plastic, that you can't focus on real crime. There is such a thing as real crime. You worked in a real crime system. Maybe you don't like the system. Maybe you should propose reforms for the system. But don't define crime as poverty. Don't de describe crime as corporate dumping and polluting. We know that those things violate laws too, but don't run everything together. Focus on real criminality, including violent crime, which is the major concern, as you well know if you're honest, it's the major concern of the people who were your clients as well as the accused. Your clients I'll bet, because I saw this for myself when I was an ADA, your clients have all been mugged themselves. They've all been crime victims as well as perpetrators. So please, let's stop broadening the discussion, Alec, to everything in the world. Let's try and focus on crime, crime itself. Now, you can make an argument that crime also includes corporate crime, what we used to call white crawler crime. Fine, I don't oppose that. But why can't we also focus on violent crime? Isn't that a major issue? Yes, it's a major issue. And for the people you serve most, it is the major issue. I, and if I could just can add, if, you, if your concern is poverty, uh, high crime neighborhoods do not have the same economic opportunities. Businesses leave, jobs leave, uh, and it was when New York got its amazing crime drop under, in the 1990s, where crime dropped 50 percent, nobody saw it coming, uh, in the first several years of, of the 1990s, that very troubled neighborhoods, business activity picked up, uh, because regular, larger, more more established chains were were moving in and didn't have to worry about their their employees. So if your concern is a, as poverty, uh, as I think it was was it Zimring perhaps said that crime is a regressive tax on poor people and policing is a progressive benefit because policing helps the poor the most. And I know. So uh, I think we have uh, enough time because we were. Starting late, our panel didn't get the full 90 minutes, so I'm going to take the moderator's prerogative and have uh, uh, Jody and Alec will, will have the last word, um, but if we can keep it brief. Yeah, as brief as I can, because people have been speaking a lot on behalf of black folk, 
you're not calling, not naming black folk as the people that we're really talking about in a lot of these cases. You know, the communities that are steeped in poverty, the savage inequality, the people, the people who are bearing the brunt of that are black folk disproportionately, grossly disproportionately, right? And a lot of, I've heard a lot of statements about what black folk want and who are, who are the victims of all this crime, right? Well, let's look at some indexes, right? Let's look at the uh, re-election of Larry Krasner in Philadelphia when there was a spike in violent homicides, right, after, and during COVID, and he was running during that spike. He's running for re-election. Not only, and he, he was running against a traditional law and order DA, put, put, uh, put up against him. Not only did he trounce that law and order DA, but he got 80% of the vote in the black community, the very community that had experienced the spike in violence because they weren't buying the fear mongering anymore that was based on, oh well, you know, these policies that really are going to benefit some of the people in your community who the police are hassling and the prosecutors are over prosecuting. This is really for your own good and you know, we have, we have paternalistic motivations and you know, we're going to infantilize you. You don't know what you really want. We know what you want. They aren't buying that anymore. You know, when you say something like Black Lives Matter doesn't care about, you know, and turns their eyes away from the violent death of black people, I don't know what you're talking about. What, I've been out there in the streets with these folks getting kettled by police. What they're saying is we do want the, the homicides and the violence in our community and the crimes to go down, but we know the best way to, for them to go down is not by investing more in police, but by investing more in the kinds of programs that lift us out of poverty, lift us out of desperation, desperate people turn to desperate undertakings like crime. That's what they're saying. They're not saying we're turning our eyes away from crime. I don't even know where that kind of thing is coming from. And facts do matter. At the end, of, one more last thing, you know, you presented, um, Heather, a lot of anecdotes and out liars, Willie Horton kinds of cases, and that can distort people's perceptions for sure, but that's why we got to get down to numbers and facts sometimes. And I do hear, Alec, I do hear you, you know, the best propaganda oftentimes is true facts, but it's also, Alec, I know that a lot of times people can distort with reality with their lies and then get legislation passed on those lies. Don Donald Trump is still running around talking about he won the election and getting a lot of people to believe that kind of stuff. Lies can have a certain efficacy. And when you look at, I'll, I'll just leave with this, um, um, Barry Weiss and this guy, um, Joe Nacero, just on Monday before the Tuesday primary, told some outright lies about what was happening in Austin with their new DA and whether crime went up or down under him, violent and property crime. And they told some basic lies. I, I, you know, he said, crime in Austin is the headline, and Barry was supporting this, has soared under a progressive district attorney. I just went and did some basic math. I went on the police, uh, Austin police's own numbers, right? I went on, looked at their own numbers, and I just broke out my calculator. In 2020, just starting with violent crime, there were 20,657. 2023, 18,568. Violent crime down 10%. Um, property crime, 2020, it was 53,024. 2023, 46,972. Down 11%. If you factor in crimes against society, they had a broad category. 2020, 79,151. 2020, 23, 71,000, 79,000, I'm sorry, 2020, 79,451, 2023, 71,553. This is basic math. You know, and, and, they, and with, with, in the face of that, that basic math, you have people talking about crime and Austin is sore, telling lies the day before the uh, primary when it can't even be refuted. And so that's what I'm saying. Let's do, let's break out some receipts, and at least we all should be able to agree on some facts that we're going to work from. I never heard of lying politicians before. By the way. Do the journalists I'm talking about. They're Barry Weiss and Sarah, a former uh, New York Times great right uh, journalist. And this will be the, the last brief I'll be comment. I'll very brief. I fear I've already overstayed my, my somewhat lukewarm welcome. <laughs> um, I, I take your, your critique, Barry. I, I fear that I may not have um, gotten my point through to you initially. Um, so I'll just try really quickly to say again, I have engaged in this work in my life 
precisely because I care about violence, precisely because I care about interpersonal harm. So I hope you don't take from my talk that I don't care about violence and harm. One part of my talk, I was identifying the hypocrisy of the criminal punishment bureaucracy because it's only enforcing some laws against some people some of the time, and it actually is not enforcing many of the legal violations that cause the most harm, that cause the most death, okay? Another part of my talk, I said that if you care about violence and you, like me, want people to experience fewer muggings, which is an interesting example because, as Stuart Hall has shown, the very term mugging was created as part of a moral panic in the 1960s in England. Um, if, you, uh, if you care about violent crime in communities, you will not be investing in s slightly different DA policies and seven-year sentences as opposed to six-year sentences and um, improving the police arrest rate by 14% or um, clearing up a court backlog, all these things that are b battered around in the news, you will not care about um, sending more police to a hot spot on a corner. Um, why, Alec? Why? Why don't you care about it? The reason, care about the reason that? as every rigorous study that's ever been done on the question on a long-term basis has shown, and I'm talking about the most rigorous randomized controlled trials, the most rigorous experimental, natural experimental studies. Those things don't determine violent crime. So what determines levels of violence are things like inequality, poverty, housing, healthcare, social alienation, mental health. These are the early childhood education. So until, These, until we solve those problems, what do you want us to do about criminal justice? Well, I think that the fallacy inherent in what you're saying, there's a couple of, well, should I? Uh, can I give you a 30 second uh, <laughs> limit? These criminal justice interventions um, don't reduce crime even in the short term. As we've seen from the rigorous experimental research, detaining people more on money bail increases short, medium, and long-term crime. Um, police hotspots from the most rigorous randomized control trials don't reduce crime. Braga's research, debunked, right? There's all these clowns masquerading out there as, as pro-police researchers. When you actually do randomized control trials, none of this stuff even matters for short-term crime. And the things that actually do reduce a little bit short-term crime are the progressive policies. That's what the research shows, but they don't even reduce it that much. So like even the progressive interventions, their benefit is not in their crime reduction, their benefit is in the general inequality reduction that they do, which then on a long-term basis reduces overall interpersonal harm. To be continued. All right, join me in thanking them. Thank you. Doesn't mean I don't love you. <laughs> Thank you so much. That's what the Oh, this is great. Great.